of even tide o'er the hills beyond the glide I go roaming to my cabin down in the glen though humble it may be that an angel wait for me in that lovely little cabin down in the glen across the moonlit hallow my lassie calls as I roam and soon we'll be together in that heaven we the most popular singing star Scotland has ever known. Singing a song he sang in village halls, in city theatres, and radio and television studios, not only in this country, but across the seas in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States of America. I'm a bit of a globetrotter myself, and I know how much the name of Robert Wilson meant to exiled Scots in places like Winnipeg and Toronto, Calgary and Melbourne, Sydney and Auckland, Pittsburgh, New York and Boston. To these people, when he walked onto the platform, always immaculate in his dress kilt, and sang the song they loved, he was Scotland. Come along, come along, let us put it out together. Come along, come along, be it fair or stormy weather. With the hills of home before us and the purple of the heather. Let us sing in happy chorus, come along, come along. So gaily sings the lark, and the sky's all awake with the promise of the day, for the road we gladly take. So it's heel and toe and forward, bidding farewell to the town, for the welcome that awaits us ere the sun goes down. Come along, come along, let us put it out together. Come along, come along, be it fair or stormy weather. With the hills of home before us and the purple of the heather, let us sing in happy chorus, come along, come along. It's the call of sea and shore, it's the tang of bog and feet, and the scent of rare and muscle that puts magic in our feet. So it's on we go rejoicing over a bracken, over a stile, and it's soon we be tramping with the last long mile. Come along, come along, let us put it out together. Come along, come along, be it fair or stormy weather. With the hills of foam before us and the purple of the heather, let us sing in happy chorus. Come along, come Robert Wilson was born in Cambus Lang on the 2nd of January 1909. There was no professional background in his family. From a very early age he loved to sing and so like so many Scottish singers he began his career in the Kirk Choir. In fact he used to walk several miles every Sunday to get there. He also sang in the Clydesdale Male Voice Choir and in the chorus of the Glasgow Light Opera Club. In fact he sang wherever and whenever he got the chance. 
but soon he began to make his mark as a soloist as well. The Kaluk Silver Band wanted someone to sing with them, and Robert was there. Often the band's concerts were in the open air, and Robert would sing a couple of songs and then go around with a hat while the band played on. He was working as a draftsman in Glasgow in these days, but draftsmanship came a very bad second to singing. But here's someone who knows far more about Robert's early days than I do. Robert was only 17 when one day he knocked at the door of a very well-known concert singer and singing teacher. He's 80 years of age now, but still as dapper as ever, and still with that flower in his buttonhole, Elliot Doby. Well, Robert came to me as a pupil for singing lessons in 1924. A fine, handsome young fellow with a shock of wavy hair. He had a nice voice of baritone timbre albeit a bit raw. But he was keen and conscientious and was always attentive to the instruction he received. He had for one so young a gentlemanly and courteous quality, transparently honest and with a sense of humor. Now these virtuous characteristics continued with him throughout the 30 years he adorned firstly the legitimate concert platform and latterly the popular stage. We had a close association for some years as teacher and pupil, and afterwards as colleagues in many ploys. I remember him winning the baritone solo at Lanark Festival on the opening day as Robert Wilson, and winning the tenor solo class the following day as Bert Wilson, a most unusual happening. I remember asking the Pellet Club to give him a show as a guest artist. He was an instant success, so much so that the London tenor engaged for the occasion objected to him being on the same bill. Now, it, it seems difficult to believe, but he was rather shy about the kilt, and I had a job persuading him to show his shanks. It took me some time also to get him to adopt the songs of the Western Isles as a feature in his program. But he gave these songs a new life. He always sent me his programs from America and press cuttings of interviews and invariably included the information that he was born in Canberra Lang and that Elliot Doby was his teacher. A very generous gesture to me, but that was Robert all over. I occasionally play over private records we made of songs and duets, those far off days, and I assure you these bring back fragrant memories of a great artist and friend. Robert was Elliot Doby's pupil for eight years, and he can take the credit for introducing him as a solo singer in the west of Scotland.
sing all day long What I'd do if you were gone Suppose I'd live on just the same Wishing you were back again Days would be endless I was a great friend of Robert Wilson. No, I was a great pal of Robert Wilson for many, many years. Now, I never talked religion with Robert Wilson. Never. I don't know if Robert Wilson ever went to church. But I do know this. I knew that he had all the Christian virtues. Above all, he had the greatest Christian virtue, charity. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to preach. The great Christian virtue of charity. There was no jealousy in Robert. Let me tell you this little story to illustrate this great charity, this kindness, this generosity. I remember reading Robert many years ago in a house in Glasgow after his show. He's playing the Alhambra, I think. And he said to me, Sidney, got a great song for you. I looked at it, tried it over. I knew this was a winner. I couldn't get to London quickly enough to record it. It was the best seller I ever had. It sold all over the world. It still sells, I think. And yet Robert, another tenor, gave it to me. Can you imagine that? You know, I don't think I myself would have done that. But that was Robert. The great charity, the great kindness, the great generosity. Tenors, you know, it's the voice commercial. No doubt about that. But tenors shouldn't go on too long. Once you've reached 50, some before, it's time to hang up your harp. Well, Robert didn't hang up his harp until well past 50. And I was always at him about it. He didn't need to, you know. Robert didn't need to do it. I remember one night, sitting at my cozy fire, the wind was howling outside, ice on the roads, dangerous time for driving. I knew Robert and his party were coming up to do a concert in the wee hall. He arrived. He came in, shivering with cold. And I said, Robert, in God's name, what are you on the roads at this time of year for? And he said, well, Sidney, you know, if I pack it up, all these boys and girls are out of a job. Again, that tremendous 
kindness and charity and love of his neighbor, thinking of other people all the time. Now, Robert was loved on the stage. And all the people who loved Robert on the stage, I feel they would have loved the Robert that his friends knew, that we knew, even more. Robert was a great man. He was a fine man. He was a great gentleman. He was a fine artist. And we're not forgetting him.
One of the things about Robert which always struck me was that he had friends everywhere and in every sphere of life. He was a kind man. He took an interest in everybody and, you know, in all the time I knew him, I can't remember ever hearing him saying an unkind word about another artist. Robert was now very much in demand for concerts in London and so he left the doily cart and settled down to this kind of work. So much in demand was he that it paid him to buy a season ticket between Houston and Glasgow Central so that he could travel up and down and cover his engagements. It was round about this time that Robert began to realise that his future lay in singing the songs of his native land. There started now a development in his career which was to become one of the most important parts of it, gramophone records, which he continued making for the rest of his life. His records sold by the thousands and they weren't the kind of records that were heard today and forgotten tomorrow. They continued to sell over a long period, and they still do today. Here's one of his early ones. I will 
Across the bridge and through the glen Walk a mile or so and then You'll see a sweet feet but unbend For the bonny lass, oh Lowry There's no one the lass divine I hear her head and she had mine I, I'll worship at the shrine of the bonny, bonny lass My first meeting with Robert Wilson was in a Sunday night concert in Benoon. In those days I was a Breton boy in the coal mines. I was only 19 years of age. And I didn't wear a kilt in those days. I wore a white tuxedo. And Robert stood at the side of the stage and uh, watched my act. When I came off, he said, uh, where are you working next week, Willie? I said, I'm back in the pits tomorrow again. What sort of money do you get? I'm quite happy with it, said I. I said, I get two pounds five a week. He says, are you free next Sunday for any Sunday concerts? I said, I think I am, but I'll have to ask the manager of the coal mine. He says, I can give you 14 guineas for a Sunday night. It was a nice wee rise on two pounds five. Anyway, about a couple of years later, I was released from the Raven Boy scheme, and I started working professionally with him. And, um... We started touring Scotland, England, a couple of seasons in Glasgow Empire, Edinburgh Empire, and we decided in 1948 it was, I think we'll tour Canada, we'll break the ice there. So we got a little fella called Thomas Fisher and a man called C. Archer Mitchell and myself and himself. So we went over by cargo passengers to Canada, opened up at Toronto in the Massey Hall, one night I can never forget, the Massey Hall Toronto, it's a 7,000 seater. The show started at 8 o'clock. Remember, there's only four of us. 8 o'clock, and we finished at a quarter past 12 that night. None of us could get off the stage. We had to do encores. So that was the only date we had in the book. People heard it, it spread through Canada about these four odd fellas. We didn't look anything like each other. So. We toured Canada. We played about 10 dates in that season. We came back home and then Robert got letters galore for a, a visit to Canada and do the whole of Canada. And that was the start of the White Heather Club going to Canada, 1948. As far as Robert goes, he was an employer of mine for 18 years, but he didn't act as an employer to me. He was a... Uh, there's, there's no way of describing what that man meant to me. He was a second father, and he paid me, well, I won't talk about the pay that he gave me, but uh, I was never paid as well as I was when I was with him. The day I saw that flash on television, I didn't know he was so seriously ill. When I saw that flash on television, the voice of Scotland died at four o'clock this afternoon. I realized then I'd lost 
the best friend that ever I had in show business. And I shall never forget the happy days, that 18 years I had with him. I never want to forget it. I never shall. The greatest friend any man in my business ever had, Robert Wilson. And those of us who followed him know very well that Robert really blazed the trail with those tours of North America. In association with Neil Kirk, a Dundee man who's been in New York for many, many years, he worked out a tour through Canada and the United States. And the Scottish associations in large towns and small towns flocked to see him. But it involved an enormous amount of work in those early days. And those of us who've come later have benefited by it. I always remember my first meeting with Robert as I was playing a dance in the Dundee Ice Rink. Now, this dance was organised by the National Sporting Committee who were trying to make money to send athletes to the Empire Games. The meeting was quite casual, really, because uh, he was in a hurry because he'd come up from the Palace Theatre where he was appearing there and uh, he just said to me, Hello, Jimmy. I'm delighted to meet you. I see you're very busy. I did a tour in 1955 in Canada and America. It was a hard tour. I mean, not much sleep connected with that kind of job, really. But I always remember one occasion. Robert had a bad abscess in one of his nostrils. And he had to have a minor operation. But I'm glad to say he was only one night off and was on the stage the next night. Oh, yes, he was a man of courage. He was the original compere of the Whitehead Club, and the band and I used to enjoy these sessions greatly. That was always very pleasant. Well, I think he was one of the finest entertainers, and he'll always be remembered. To me, he was one of nature's gentlemen. Remember the story of Bruce and the spider? Who is he? <laughs> what do you mean, who is he? Don't tell me you've never heard of Bruce and the Spider. Did you never read Scottish history? Did you ever go to school? Yes, I was ten years in the one class. <laughs> oh, in the primary, eh? Well, I, well, I couldn't get out. <laughs> <laughs> well, for your edification, young man, Bruce was the man who led the Scots. I thought that was Laurie Riley. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm speaking of the past, not, oh. the, not the present. A long time ago. Oh, yes, a long time ago. Long before you were even chipped off the tree. Ha, ha, ha. yes. Before you were born. Oh, yes, a long time before I was born. That must have been a long time ago. <laughs> go on the cheeky, go on with the story, Ralph. Well, anyway, Bruce had been defeated in battle. Had he? Yes. Yes, yes. And he was sitting all alone in a cage. Yes, yes. Feeling very depressed. Yes, yes. <laughs> Very depressed. Yes. 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 <laughs> what are we whispering at? Oh, hell, I don't know. Oh, well, come on. Pick up. Okay. And suddenly he looked up and he saw a wee spider climbing up the wall. Yes, a wee yes. spider. A wee scotch spider. How do you know it was scotch? Well, it had a kilt on. <laughs> <laughs> the wee thing, oh, he saw that wee spider climbing, climbing up the wall, up and down and up and down I and up and down and up and down. I can't see the darn thing anywhere, can you? Oh, you're hopeless, McGee. Oh, you oh, absolute. You can't tell a story. Oh, can't I? No, you're a singer. All right, then I'll sing it to you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, and thing. you'll cock your luck, eh? <laughs> In days of old, the story so the Scots were very blue. Because the English beat them in a little fight or two. The Scottish king was Robert Bruce, who had a mighty fall. Until he saw a little spider climbing up the wall. Sing it, try, try, try again. Try and try again. Don't give up, although you fall. Spider kept on falling, though he never thought to stop. And just as he was passing out, he got right to the top. King Robert gave another look and shouted out with glee. If that's the way a spider works, it's good enough for me. Sing it, try, try, try
lifted up the telephone and called the English king. Come on, he said, my noble Ned, and do the Highland fling. I'll send your toughest fighting man, the one you called him Boon. We'll make him run from Bannockburn. To Edinburgh again. Say it, cry, cry, cry again. was over six feet tall and weighed a ton and more. But Robert bent that house, shy, gentle, left and feeling sore. The English ran the Scotsman, keel the whiskey flowed like wine. And since that day, the Scots and spiders get along just fine. Bring it, try, try, try again. Try and try again. Don't give up on all your flaws. Why don't you try, try, try again. Try and try again. You know, I'm very fond of a broth, too. Oh, it's a Lord, great you're a, a citizen of a broth. Yes. I'm very fond of it. And I always enjoy my smokies when I go up there. Oh, you know, I can eat three in a row. Three? Yeah. There's some of them up there can eat half a dozen. You're kidding. I'm not kidding. Eat half a dozen? Aye, and oh. more. Oh. As the story goes about a fella come down from St. Vigens, a plumin. Aye. Tom Goldie was his name. Mm-hmm. He come down to our broth, and one day he was walking along there, and he felt very, very hungry, and he went into a restaurant for the first time in his life. He sat himself down at a table. He worked his way through a bowl of soup. And then he'd a side of roast beef and tatties and <laughs> kale and all the rest of it. Uh-huh. And then the waitress came up with the menu and she said, Now, sir, what would you like for dessert? Mm-hmm. And Tom was a wee bit flung with the words. So he turned around and he says, Oh, just bring me a plate of bacon and eggs. Andy Stewart. Looking back now, the name and the man, Robert Wilson, figure very largely in my career. Take, for example, my break into the White Heather Club. This first White Heather Club was all arranged for a day in May. Robert was to be the host and the compter, and I was merely booked as one of the guest artists. Well, we did a videotape of the show, but unfortunately, this videotape didn't prove to be usable. And by the time this was discovered, Robert was away out of the country to appear in a show in Dublin. So there's panic stations, and then a producer came and said to me, I wonder, could you do Robert Wilson's job? And I said, well, I'll do my best to fill his shoes. We did the show live with myself doing the host and the compelling in the show. And probably because of this fateful day and this fateful tape recording of the show, I was asked a year later when Robert left the television show because of pressure of stage work to compare the show and to do Robert's job. And, of course, that was something I did uh, for four years following this. Then there was the question of recording. I couldn't get a recording contract with any company in, in London. But Robert said to me, look, I'm recording for a label. I'll talk to the boss of this company. You can come down and do a recording with my session. And I did this. I recorded with Robert's group. I sang Donald Richard Cruisers and the Dancing and Kyle that proved to be my first successful record. The Glasgow Empire seasons, 1961 and 1962, it was because of the fact that I'd been seen initially in the presentation of a week show that Robert did in the Glasgow Empire that I was eventually asked to bring my own Scottish show into the Glasgow Empire for these two years. There's the question of the American tour. Robert, it was, who brought Neil Kirk, who then owned the tours, to see me in Largs. Neil Kirk liked me. He didn't move me for that year because I wasn't available, but two years later, I went to America and starred in this show through this introduction and help given to me by Robert Wilson. I'll just finish by telling you one thing which, again, proves the tremendous generosity and willingness to help in Robert Wilson. We had lunch together. He said to me, I'd like you to do a tour with me. You've done four successful tours already. Will you do another one? And we talked about a deal, and eventually Robert said to me, look here, son, I shouldn't say this, but you're, I think you're big enough to stand on your own two feet now. Why don't you promote a tour yourself, and you can take both the glory and the profit? And I think this was a very wonderful thing for a man in his position to say to someone like myself who was just starting to establish themselves in show business.
It was Robert Wilson who revived, I think, the monologue, and particularly in television. I'd never seen anybody do a monologue in television. I saw Robert do his very successful one, uh, Dandy, and I followed this up with quite a few efforts of my own. Come on a hand, you want to take. Did everybody see you like? All aren't you all they put your eyes. Come on a hand. Never heed the rabbits. No bite there. Or a war your luck. Now, certainly, call your silent duck. Now, all the day can through the park. Let's see if we can do some work. Way wide there. Fetch them to the bank. Way wide there. Yon the bums bang. Get to the bottom. Watch the gap. Hey, Dante. Hold them to the slot. You've got them to that sneaky bag. Now bring them in. Get lads. Get lads. Now tack them tiny all the know. Hey, Dante. Hold that mock at you. The feather young. Close your grab the you. You pull my nose and step. Aye, 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 aye. Aye, aye, that's the end. Get done. Get that no harder carny than a tongue. She's mocked bad eyes, she's unborn. For oh, hate it, death, I win the morn. Oh, dear, feast your yelp and randy and then I fresh them. Dark, dark, dandy. He's all the day, the deal be end. The honor and tidy. Come on, hunt. Incidentally, the thing that fascinated me was that uh, the general public might believe that the biggest singing entertainer in Scotland, as Robert Wilson was, if he saw a new talent coming up like Kenneth McKellar, would want to push it aside and brush it under the carpet. Quite the reverse. Um, Robert Wilson thought, there's a great new talent, I must encourage it and bring it out. Um, Robert had a marvellous, he had a great heart. Uh, Big, generous man, Robert Wilson. Because uh, this is the old traditional showbiz story turned upside down. The story of the big star who employs a little songwriter to write a song, gives him a fiver for it. The songwriter dies in poverty and the big star goes on to make millions. Uh, Robert asked me to put a lyric to the old pipe tune, Scotland the Brave. Well, this is 25 years ago, nearly 30 years ago. Uh, for a pantomime in the Alhambra. And I did it one Saturday and took it to him and he said, that's fine, could you change this and that? Certainly I changed this and that. Could you put another verse onto it? Fine. And then in the end he said, no, money. And, you know, the, the Scots working class chap hates talking about money. It's embarrassing. Uh, he says, whatever you think, Mr. Wilson. And Robert said, well, how about a £20 advance on royalties? Uh, I was doing very well on, I think, £12 a week at the time. And I said, Robert, the song is not going to outlast the pantomime. 20 pounds in my hand and I'll go away. And he said, Cliff, you are not going to cheat yourself. I'll give you a 20 pound advance that will be in the post and a royalty contract. I said, you're daft. This song, you know, it's going to die the death in six weeks. The first royalty check, I think, was 280 pounds six months later. And that's the upside down story of the greedy star. Uh, Robert Wilson was the very ungreedy star, and I was the kid who knew everything. Boy, was I ever <laughs> ignorant about Scotland the Brave. Sunlit places 
Carmichael. As you all know, Robert toured Scotland one night here and one night there, and these tours I enjoyed very much indeed. But there was one feature about the tours which no one knew about except Robert and myself. For instance, after the show some night, he would say to me, how are you placed in the morning, Harry? And I'd say, I'm not doing anything in particular. He'd say, well, would you care to come along to such and such hospital? I'd, I'd like to give him a half an hour's entertainment. And I'd say, certainly, that's all right. Well, I'd meet him in the morning, a long way go, and entertain the folks, various places, children, old people. And the reception he got was, oh, really marvellous. If you could have seen some of these people's faces, it really was a treat. And one occasion I remember, I think they had the, the all-time small record for an audience, an audience of one, one little girl. And she was in a little room, a private room in this hospital. And you never saw a room like it. It was like a, a theatrical agent's office. There wasn't a, a bare spot on the wall at all with pictures and the song copies of Robert Wilson. Some of them signed. They had signed in by mail uh, when she'd written to him. We sang and played to this wee lassie, and it was really a, a treat. Uh, in fact, I had a lump in my throat and a wee tear in my ear, which wasn't to be wondered at. That was only one occasion, but this happened, oh, perhaps three or four days a week. And I'm quite sure this was the great point about Robert. He wasn't seeking publicity. He just did this. In fact, he was, he, he was the very opposite. He, he wanted to keep it a secret, if anything. But Robert's essential kindliness came out in other ways, too. For instance, his, his thought for young people who were trying to enter the theatrical profession. Many as a young artist came along uh, and just gave us a little audition, and Robert would say, ah, there's somebody with some talent. And if he thought they were good at all and really sincere with their approach to the business, he would give them every chance possible. In fact, some of our stars today, I'm sure, owe their first start in the, this profession to Robert Wilson. Yeah. Uh... 